So I'll mm -hmm. most likely keep almost everything you say, unless you okay. tell me to take it out. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because sometimes there's just that, you know, Kevin wants to interject for a few minutes and go off on a tangent. Right. I'll take right. that out later. <laughs> I've gotten, gotten really good. It's like, it's like editing your book. Yeah, 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 yeah. Are you put, darlings? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Tracy Rhodes is the author of the book, Not All Who Wander Spiritually Are Lost, A Story of Church. She is a writer and Bible teacher and blogs regularly at tracesoffaith.com. You can follow her where I found her on Twitter, where she can be found with the username Traces of Faith. Tracy Rhodes, thank you so much for joining me in conversation with. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. I'm looking forward to it. Me too. And it's just a wonderful uh, view that you've given us there. So this is uh, obviously your home and it's very beautiful and you have a wonderful day. And just to let our, all of our listeners know, Tracy has recently purchased some lovely wind chimes. So if we hear the wind chimes, <laughs> that's the ambiance for our meeting and we will be creating happy, a mood. <laughs> happy to enjoy that part of the mood. Tracy, would you mind starting us off by reading a, a section of your book? Sure. Sure. Um, the section that we have chosen, just to give you a little bit of um, background, I share about um, my granddad, who was diagnosed with um, Alzheimer's disease years ago, pretty early on when they were still learning a lot about Alzheimer's. And so the paragraph that I'm going to read is after he has passed away, and we have gone to um, the a nearby church that uh, is, is smaller in nature. I grew up in a smaller community. And so I'm just writing about the people basically that were um, at that funeral. The people of God, our church family, also stepped in to help during our time of grieving. If you've ever been loved on by a church when a family member has passed away, you know how much their kindnesses mean. I saw my church family in the crowd of people at granddad's funeral, and I knew we had their support. A few years later, when mom would lose her younger brother in a tragic car accident, these same people would walk alongside us again. We couldn't make sense of all this sorrow, but as my aunt sang at granddad's funeral, farther along we'll know all about it. Farther along we'll understand why. So cheer up my brother, live in the sunshine, We'll understand it all by and by. All by and by. Thank you for reading that for us, Tracy. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I picked that and asked Tracy to read that. There was, uh, I think, a timing for that. And as I read the book, um, I recognized there's so much of a need now for uh, what you call, you know, faith family, right? And uh, yeah. the sense of community that we find. I love the phrase, if you've mm -hmm. ever been loved on. Yeah. Is yeah. that is that a is that a um, a way of speaking that you're familiar with from a part of the country? <laughs> is it from one of the churches? Is it part of your lexicon? Where does that if you've ever been loved on? I, usually, folks would say if you've ever been cared for, if you've ever been loved, right? But loved mm -hmm. on, and I I just feel like it's this pouring on. Yeah, I I think it probably comes from the smaller communities that I grew up in. I grew up in rural Missouri, live in rural Michigan now. And yeah, I can, I think I can see my, my aunts and my grandmas using the phrase loved on. Uh, it's so much a part of my vernacular that I guess I didn't really think about it, but yeah, loved on with a little bit of an accent probably. Oh, can you do the <laughs> accent for me? Yeah. Loved on. Oh, loved on. <laughs> I love it. Mm -hmm. We get, we get to be loved on, uh, in our families. We get to be loved on in our communities. We get to be loved on mm -hmm. in the in the interactions we have with even people we've met on Twitter. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, Tracy and I were just talking about how it's nice to actually feel like you meet people uh, virtually through Twitter and Facebook or, or meetings like this that you actually learn to care for. Mm -hmm. I think that the phrase, uh, and I'm going to ask you to talk about uh, this phrase, faith family. Can you tell us what, what does that mean to you today? Today? <laughs> <laughs> that that um, that phrase changes, I think, over time. You know, when in the part of the book that I'm looking back on, I think it was a small church community that I had grown up in. As it turned out, that church community was extended family. It's just kind of the way our, our neighborhood went. But today, I think that gets bigger and bigger 
um, I, the, the premise of the book is the idea that as a Christian, which is what I am, we often get in our own little circles, either of our own churches or over our own denominations, you know, and not that that's necessarily a bad thing where it gets bad. I think is when you think you're the only church or the only denomination and what I explore in the book and in all of my writing really online and on Twitter, et cetera, is the idea of how big did Jesus expect that faith family to, to be. And, you know, and then, and then you look at the, um, the, the family of the human race, right? So just a lot of consideration of family. I would say today, my faith family includes a lot of uh, different, you know, I have, um, I have Jewish friends that I would consider faith family. I have many, many Christians from all kinds of uh, different countries and different um, traditions that I would consider faith family. So yeah, I, absolutely from especially from the time period that I was writing about there I think that's gotten bigger the the term family I think I was implying that much like you mentioned it, it's a true caring and it's a um, it, it's wanting as a Christian it's wanting other Christians to continue growing and to continue finding more and more of Jesus that's a, um, a phrase I use in the book a lot too so much of the exploring that I do, wandering, as I call it in the book title, is all to find more of Jesus and to find more of the abundant life that Jesus offers. And I find that when I read your book and when I talk to you, and then when I live my own life, interact with you and others, that I find, I find my, those connections that, that I'm looking for, that sense of spiritual uh, wellness, wholeness, Mm -hmm. solace. And as I asked you to read that piece, because today I think many of us are suffering uh, more greatly mm -hmm. than, than maybe we even ever expected to uh, with mental, yeah. physical, emotional, and spiritual brokenness that we find and can find that, uh, that connection, or as you and I were saying earlier, that conduit uh, uh, to God uh, in each other in our relationships with each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tracy, the word family has, as you know, because Tracy has listened to a little bit of my um, uh, YouTube channel and other interviews, uh, the word family has a very uh, strong meaning for me. Uh, and I have strong feelings about the word family. Uh, as an adoptee, family means something very, very particular for me. And some families can be really supportive while others are destructive, less supportive. Uh, communities, and that's just a word I'm using, communities, on the other hand, uh, that aren't particularly a family. Uh, mm -hmm. They can allow for more exploration and, and flexibility. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of, I, I lean towards that in my, my wording. I felt at home with joining various communities that I felt comfortable in. Would you say the word family and community uh, are interchangeable in regards to faith? I grew up singing a song, been in church my whole life, and I grew up singing a song called The Family of God. And some of the lyrics say, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. And I think for me, I have always tried to create something a little tighter knit than a community um, uh, among the, the, the people that I went to church with, the people who I shared my faith with. I have heard the term community used in churches for sure, um, a, a church community versus a family. And I know when I put, when I ask about church being a family on Twitter, I'll get a lot of pushback. I get a lot of pushback on Twitter for anything I say, but, um, but you know, I, I, he I hear what you're saying and I don't, I'll ask you this, um, Kevin, do you feel like being in a community with a group of people has the same commitment level? No. And I think that's an important ration. That's an important way to answer no. I think that family is, again, very particular to me. There's the positives and negatives around family. There's also the, I don't want to just use the word commitment, 
but there is the loyalty, there is the sense of even if we never speak to each other again, you're still my family. Mm-hmm. Even if we have broken so far apart in our beliefs, in our hopes, our dreams, our loves, I will always know you as family and you will always know me as family. Now, I, of course, was adopted. So I was relinquished at birth. Yeah. And the idea that that was my family, that was my original family. And it was broken, you know, immediately, just broken yeah. immediately. Um, and yet that family, the essence of that, that family relationship I, I, I believe for me and, and for my biological mother uh, was always there. It was, uh, a, it's more than commitment. It's, it's more than loyalty. It's mm-hmm. something that's, um, I think, indisputable for me personally, uh, that family and allowing that word family to then be transposed into a community of faith-based people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. is a risk for me that's been difficult. I think that's what I, to answer your question as wholly as I can. Yeah. And yet the risk has, uh, as we all know, no risk, no rewards, Yeah. right? You take the risks and there are some, there's some absolute right. beauty in that. I can understand your question and I think it's a great one. Um, I think that uh, it's important that for me to understand that being wandering spiritually, right? And I love that that's always in the parentheses, you Mm -hmm. know, uh, because I wandered and was broken and lost for longer than most people can imagine and longer than I would like to imagine. And yet that wandering was not for naught and the being spiritually um, incomplete was uh, a part of that journey that is now more important to me than this, if I had always felt that I, I that I knew where my spiritual family was, where my spiritual ilk was, mostly because I believe that it allows me to be more open-minded and and willing to incorporate other people's journey, other people's wanderings, other people's current lostness in their life, in my life. I don't yeah. have a precondition. And I, that, to be honest, that I'm glad you asked the question so I could answer it. It's the real reason why I said, Tracy, would you like to chat for a few today? I was found, I found the book riveting. And I also found, of course, your Twitter president presence to be authentic as people would say today. I don't really like that word because I think you can be authentic in, in, inauthentically authentic and authentically inauthentic. <laughs> so, but you're just you. And I trust that that I could be wrong in that, but I'm I'm open to where you are. And I think in a big way, it's because I think that you're open to where I am on, on my journey. I appreciate that. Yeah. Can I segue one question too, or another question? Do you have people not adopted and not biological that you would consider family? friends who have become family does that make sense it just, does just and pushing a little more on that family concept it, it it does and it's an important really really important genuine i think discussion to have about the difference uh and i think that for me um family and uh what people would say is uh you know chosen family uh, mm-hmm. and um is is there's a word today I, I kind of started using fungible, you know, it's a new word because these they have these new things called non-fungible tokens or something. So mm-hmm. NFTs and I found what the heck is that word? I've never used it before. So I'm going to use it. You know, I find that family and mm-hmm. the chosen family relationships are uh, there's there's mutability there. It does allow me to flex and incorporate different aspects, different relationships, different relationships into Mm -hmm. the concept of what family means to me. But I think as much Mm -hmm. as my spiritual journey continues, so does my understanding of family. Yeah, no, I I think that exploring the two together is a good exercise. It yeah. sure is. Well, thank you for asking me. Gosh, yeah. you sure do know. Yeah. Maybe you, I'm going to let you take the interview. <laughs> I'm always you know, thinking. You, you talk, you talk, uh, you talk about allowing, um, this is a great word, uh, mystery. 
I love mystery because a lot of people, I, I work in technology as much as I do acting and writing and other things. Uh, mm -hmm. And people used to say, well, you're a technology guy, right? You must like puzzles. And I said, no, I, I can do a puzzle, but, I'm, but I love a good mystery because I always know that there's gonna be a clue that'll lead to another clue and I'm good at following clues. You talk about allowing uh, for more mystery and faith and you, you talk about giving it room to breathe. Uh, you mm -hmm. write, and I'll quote you, that none of us have God figured out, <laughs> though God doesn't seem to mind one bit. It's mm -hmm. why I explore. Tell me what you mean when you say well, God doesn't seem to mind, especially what it means in regards to developing a relationship with God. I was talking with a friend recently, and we were talking about scripture and how lots of denominations and lots of different scholars, lots of different individuals can take one verse and can understand it differently, right? That's how we get our concepts of communion and when to baptize, et cetera, et cetera. And I told her, and I think this often, God could be with, as clear with his communication as he wanted to be, right? He is God. He could, um, he could very clearly, you know, at birth, we could know some of these things that, that we debate, uh, that we find in scripture. And so I have found it, I read the Bible very regularly, um, a, a lot of time each day. It's just become a discipline of mine. And I have found that I don't read it so much for answers. There are some concrete answers, but I read it because I like to sit in his presence. And because if I have questions, I'll be very honest with you. I listened, as I told you, to some of your story before we did our interview. And I was a little nervous um, because Kevin, what happened to you was truly horrific. And, and the hurdles that you have overcome, the hours of therapy, I would imagine you have spent. You refer often in your other interviews to the 12 steps. Um, I have a brother who has struggled with addiction. And so I have a little bit of familiarity with the 12 steps. But what I was nervous about, we don't have answers for, for what happened. Um, in, in your life, we don't have answers for bad things that have happened in my life or anyone's. Uh, sometimes we get glimpses, but by and large, we, we don't always, it, God is God, you know, and, and I think that's what I was implying um, when I said he doesn't mind a bit. I hope he didn't mind me saying that. Um, what, what I meant by it was he, he wants us to know the parts of himself that he has made known. And those are beautiful and those are, they carry us through. They give me a tremendous amount of hope. And that, that's what I like to gift others if I can um, on, on his behalf. But yeah, solving God, um, I, I often say on Twitter, I used to read the Bible so that I could prove I was right. I thought I would eventually find all the answers. And what I found instead that's way, way better is God, God himself. It's the relationship that you're yeah. talking about. And thank you for answering so directly. And I am i was more nervous than you meeting you today than you were meeting me. <laughs> well, we'll, we met. We'll, we'll, we'll talk, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so these are two people who were very nervous to meet each other, who would have thunk it. <clears throat> and I would love, you know, to, to allow that, if anyone's listening or watching right now, to sink in for a minute, right? These are two people that don't know each other and yet found out just enough about each other to get a little fidgety about this conversation. And I just mm -hmm. want to reflect for the moment just how far we've come just in the last, say, I don't know, I'm not keeping track, 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. Did we, I don't feel like I'm nervous anymore. I, this yeah. is not coming across, I'm sure, to anyone. But we probably sound like old friends that planned this for months. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. we didn't. Tracy, I was out all day without internet access and Tracy <laughs> was out at a graduation today. She yeah. about an yeah. hour ago, she emailed me and says, where's the link? And I said, <laughs> oh, here it is. And, you know, yeah. we are not only nervous, um, but we're trusting. 
of, you know, that this is going to go the way it's supposed to go. Mm -hmm. um, it may not make sense to even anyone else. Um, but in the moment, I'm going to trust that if one person can listen to this and be uplifted, if one person can hear this and watch us and say, maybe I can, maybe I can trust somebody like that. Maybe yeah. I can reach out. And that's what we're here for. The, uh, the idea of sitting in, in his presence is very familiar to me. Tim Keller is the um, uh, pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian Church. And I think there's a great video that he did a while ago on the difference between mindfulness, meditation, as we would say in different faiths, in different practices, let's use the word, because mindfulness and meditation can be a practice. And I think that's really wholly very helpful. And he said there's a difference between that and meditating on the word. And there's a difference between being open to whatever comes and mm -hmm. being and wanting to have a relationship with, uh, with the word. And I'm using that in capital letters mm -hmm. uh, for, your, for your sake, but for mine too. And Tim, Tim has, I think, you know, just probably as many detractors as you do on Twitter or Facebook or wherever we post, mm -hmm. uh, as many people that will dispute or just, you know, uh, um, but I think there is a sense that I hear from you that sitting in that, uh, in the word and sitting in his presence for you is enough. That you're not yeah. looking for all the answers. You're not looking for all the guidance. Uh, you're, that that is enough just to be able to sit in his presence. Mm -hmm. You know, I, in the introduction that you read about me, you mentioned um, that I'm a Bible teacher and I am such a curious learner, you know, that, that makes the best teachers, right? So I'm constantly wanting to learn more and more about the word. I love church history, um, all, all of it. I am just so fascinated. And God has really taught me, I would say, probably the last three or four years, that there are different ways to approach him. That, that it's fine that I want to know the knowledge and I want to know the Greek word and the context and all of those like scholarly theological things. But he also really likes it. And I really am fulfilled by time just reading a psalm out loud. For example, I have started using prayer books, Book of Common Prayer, um, the Valley of Vision, ancient prayers that have been part of the Christian faith for hundreds of years, those are so grounding as well. Those, I often read those before I start diving into my um, Bible time each day because I liken it to a breath. You know, I mean, I, I um, there's a Coptic Orthodox prayer book that I use and it starts out in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And anytime I say those words, it's like my breath instinctively knows to go inhale, exhale, you know, and, and that's a settling thing. Um, so it's it's been, that's been a lot of my exploring is realizing that there are different ways to encounter God, that it doesn't all have to be knowledge. And certainly, you know, then you get into conversations about uh, the period of time that we live in. You get into situations where you look at Eastern lens versus Western lens of our faith and of Christianity, et cetera. And it's all pretty fascinating, but I, I enjoy what I've learned and my faith, my I hesitate to use a relationship. I feel like that word's become kind of trite, but um, my connection to God is deeper now than it was before I started doing those things. Yeah, thanks. The word relationship's the only one that I know, and I do understand <laughs> the triteness of it. Uh, and it just like authenticity, authentic yeah. Yeah. relationship. It's unfortunate because it's what we mean. <laughs> it's, it what, just... it's, it's what it's what. It's mm -hmm. what was asked of us was mm -hmm. to be in relationship, right? Yeah. Not yeah. just to be knowledgeable, um, not just to dictate to others. What I find is that when I am, as I am in this moment, as I try to be kind of from the first breath of the day, uh, when I feel like I'm in relationship with, and I'll, I'll use the 12-step 
uh, jargon. Uh, yeah. When I'm in relationship with my higher power, right? I can be much more open to being with you when you're, while you're in relationship with your higher power, with your God. And mm -hmm. that is not something that I want to have to dictate. Um, in other words, I don't want you to have to meet me on my terms. I want to, I want you to meet me on your terms. I want you to meet me where you are in your relationship, in your, and that's the word relationship is, you're right. It could sound very, I don't want to use the word artificial, but um, what's the, what's the, I'm not good at this because I'm not young anymore, but you know, um, a relationship, what was it, but with benefits, something like that, mm -hmm, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it, yeah. I, I forget, something with benefits, I can't, you know, somebody will jokingly tell me that. Mm -hmm. Kevin, you you really don't get it, do you? No, sometimes <laughs> I'm glad I don't. I gave up. I gave up. I gave up. To get right, it, yeah. but you know, <laughs> I'm in a relationship, friendship with benefits, or something like that. And I think there's there's all that triteness about it, or that that lightness about it. That that I only want what I want, and I'm like, no, I want to be fully. I want to be fully present with my relationship as I journey spiritually, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I want to be with. I'm very much so in joy being with people who are fully in relationship in their spiritual journey mm -hmm. rather than it just be you know a friendship with benefits yeah, uh, yeah well sure. i think I, I think i actually pulled that rabbit out of a hat i think it's what it's called and i think that could be what many uh people are uh and i didn't want to go down this rabbit hole too much but i think it could be what many people are i don't want to use the word put off by but uh maybe kind of look and say geez that that's not really that appealing that your relationship with God, your relationship with your higher power is transactional, is, uh, is something about, you know, um, I do something good, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to get something good. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm following this rule or that rule. I think it confuses people, but I think that when I watch other people that are attracted to me and my spiritual journey, it's, it's, uh, it's because it's not transactional. I'm, I'm fully, I'm fully lost and, mm -hmm. and, and, and fully loved. Right. And I find myself using the term abundant living a mm. lot. Um, it, it's scriptural. And so that's where I pull it from, but it, the idea has really captured me because I think we can go through life in different ways, right? Like I would, I would assume that 15, 20 years ago, you were not as healed as you are now. And I think sometimes for lots and lots of different reasons, people kind of go so far and then stop. Uh, may, maybe it hurts too much or maybe they're just not ready, right? Uh, I, I noticed at the end of the 12 steps that I looked at um, before the call, it said, um, we do not ask participants to do all 12 steps at once at the beginning, if they're not ready. And I thought, how interesting, you know, I'm, I might not be ready to do step number three. And what I try to do in my personal life is ask, be bold enough to ask God for full abundant living. That means um, an awareness of my imperfections. It means spending enough time with him that he can mold and make me into a more Christ-like person. And I, I think that that is some of what people find attractive, not necessarily about me, but just in general. When you, when you know that a person is boldly going after it, uh, w when they're willing to be brave and face, you know, whatever the latest hurdle is. And let's face it, we do that in a public way a lot of times with social media, et cetera, right? especially when you're a writer and an interviewer. <laughs> um, but every time I'm like, that was worth it. It was worth it to face that really hard thing. It was worth it to ask God to help me with X, Y, Z, because I have more of him. And I feel like the abundant life just got a little more abundant. The abundance is clear to me. It's clear to me when I'm, again, I can use this word very carefully now. I don't want to be trite. When I'm in relationship. And I'm going to make this real simple. Right now, I'm completely engaged in this relationship with you. 
Mm -hmm. We can call it what it is, but I am in relationship with you. Mm -hmm. And this is not possible from my perspective without my spiritual foundation being as strong as it can be at any given time. And I notice when I'm interviewing people, when I'm chatting with folks, mm -hmm. I'm sensing that. I'm sensing that their relationship with me is also based on their spiritual foundation, wherever it is at that time. Nothing has to be perfect, except, it, you know, um, uh, is why I was very nervous about talking to you today. Um, <clears throat> nothing has to be perfect except his love for us. There's nothing else that I'm looking for that um, mm. is going to replace that. Uh, is going to um, lift me up and keep me up, right? Nothing else. Mm -hmm. But my understanding that of his love for me with, you know my story a bit. Mm -hmm. um, if you read the book in the future, you'll understand more. But, you know, quite, quite simply, um, when, when I finally pulled the curtain back and said, this is your life, this wasn't about, oh my gosh, I've got to start, I've got to stop this terrible lifestyle and straighten up. And, you know, how could I ever speak to Tracy in 35 years if I don't get my act together here? You know, I better, <laughs> I better, better brush my teeth. <laughs> I didn't feel like I was, I was in such poor straits that I didn't feel like I deserved to exist. Yeah. The life had been that hard. And what I saw did not look like anything that God could ever love. Yeah. So there was an absolute despondency and I understood that I neglected to even acknowledge that I was lost. I had neglected to even uh, wonder if I could uh, wander and, 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 be, and be in his presence. Like, can mm -hmm. I wander? Can I be wandering? Can I be really, really soulfully wandering and, and feeling disconnected from God and still understand that he's there and he loves me? Can I do that? That was an enormous lift for me because I felt so unworthy. I felt unworthy of, of a, a day. I felt unworthy of my life. I felt unworthy of my body and I felt unworthy of, of God. Are you kidding? I know that that's hard for someone like you to probably, you know, reel in and say, gosh, yeah, I've, I've had that experience. I don't tell my stories so that people can always identify with them. I just tell the stories because sometime you may have some other moment in your life where you may have, you may hear a similar story. It may be a family member. You mentioned somebody in your family who struggles. Mm -hmm. It may be just a friend or it just may be a friend of a friend and that friend is trying to understand, you know, and is frustrated. And maybe because we've had this conversation or you've watched a video or read the book or, you know, you've got a little bit more of an understanding of how lost and broken and yet loved and um, accepted we can, we can be. There's hope. Mm -hmm. There's some semblance of, I don't want to say rhyme or reason, but there is hope that out of all this pain and suffering and tragedy and, yeah. uh, and mourning, and I've had to mourn greatly for everything I've lost. Um, there's redemption would be fair. Uh, there's, um, there's a resurrection. And that is really, that would have been un, unfathomable to me to even consider that. Yeah, it's really beautiful. I, I was thinking through this afternoon, different, um, Bible characters that we could, that we could contemplate that would maybe match, um, up some with your situation and Job came to mind. Um, and I, I don't know how familiar your audience will be, but Job is a character early on in the old Testament. And in summation, he had everything. He had riches. He had um, a number of children. He had a wife. He had uh, land. And all of his children um, died in the, in the same um, locale. And then his, 
that his health was taken. And we know behind the scenes that Satan has asked God if he can um, test Job in this way, if he can take these things from Job and if Job will still choose to be faithful. And you read, it's, it's 42 chapters, I believe. You read the whole book and you um, hear all these friends give terrible, terrible advice. It's a good like what not to do book to read. And at the end, we are told that Job gets back everything he lost. He has more children. He um, gets, his, gets his health restored. And that story never sits right with me. And I have told God this because there's still memories and there's still loss that Job has to deal with. But I, um, if you don't mind, I, Job, the very end of Job has this verse that every year when I come to it, it gives me chills. It's Job 42, five. And he says, it's Job speaking to God. I had heard rumors about you, but now my eyes have seen you. And I think some of those some of those things in our life, whatever it looks like, they help us see God in ways that we couldn't. And I think what I am so drawn to, I, I don't know if you call your work ministry, Kevin, um, but what I am so drawn to about what you are doing and your willingness to share your story is that it's so very honest and it, and it helps us see that God can do a work. And like you said, whenever you tap into the, the presence of that higher power, there's redemption, there's restoration. There's not always answers. I, w I wish there were, Job wished there were too, but there's more. You know, and uh, like I say, that's, um, you know, in the, in the morning, the first prayers I breathe, that's my inhale and my exhale. Um, they, there's, there's more to be found of God. And I, th I think that can be nothing but a vessel of hope for us. A and I think you point people to that as well. So thank you. Thank you. That's beautiful. <clears throat> and I, I, <clears throat> I value that, um, that, that, um, the grace with which you say that yeah because i know that it's <clears throat> we're different people different trajectories who knows mm -hmm. where we'll meet again who knows mm -hmm. why the heck god put us together right now <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah i'm a lot i'm a lot more particular years ago i was i uh, graduated from college i was very 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 lost and, and not in a terrible way just boy uh, it's a great story. I'll tell you some other day, but I was wandering to the point of, I don't even know if God exists. Just don't even know. Mm -hmm. But I was going door to door for this mm -hmm. group called the Environmental Planning Lobby, knocking on doors for contributions. And I was probably just bored, but the first person I met was this lady <laughs> named Mary. Yeah, I didn't want to, I didn't, probably didn't want to do my job. And <laughs> she, she wanted to give me $15 as a donation. And I, and she said, but you know, I, my check doesn't come till next week and I've got medicine and, but I really want to give it. And I said, no, 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 it's okay. It's okay. I mean, I was ready to pull my own money out of my pocket and put yeah. it in her name. Yeah. And she said, no. And she looked at me and she goes, I really want to, I really, really want to do it. Can you take a post-dated check? And I said, I'm not supposed to, but sure. Cause I could tell. So she wrote me the check, long story short. And she, at the end, I just stopped. Something stopped me. And I said, can I ask you something? She said, sure. And she was like 85 years old, just beautiful little old lady. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, you got all this going on. You, you, I can tell you want to be so generous and you don't have much and you struggle and your health. And I said, when everything's not okay, what makes everything okay? Yeah. And she looked at me without, without missing a beat. She just said, I love my God and my God takes care of me. That's it. Yeah. And I just said, thank you. And I went on my day, but you know, every door I knocked on, if I felt like the person would be receptive, I actually asked that question yeah. <laughs> to everyone. It was like this <laughs> interview of all interviews. It was my prep for this interview today, probably. And everybody <laughs> gave me a different answer than she did. Mary's answer was the only one. Every answer was like my family, right? My job, yeah. my this, my children, my, my, my garden. It could be all these different things. Yeah. And in the last house of the day, Everyone was in the car waiting for me to go back and they were all, come on, Kevin. And this person wrote out a check and she was very nice and she had this beautiful house. And I said, I kind of just didn't, felt like I didn't want to leave. And I looked at her and I said, 
you know, you live right next door to that beautiful church. That's really a nice looking church. She goes, yeah, it is. And I said, do you go to that church? And she said, yeah, I'm actually the pastor of that church. Oh. <laughs> and I said, I got to ask you something. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. said, I've been asking people all day, you know, when everything's not okay, mm. what makes everything okay? And she paused, like Mary gave me the answer. She paused and waited so long that I finally said, you don't have to answer. And she said, no, <laughs> I, I want to pick the right words. Mm. And this pastor who obviously just had a good head on her shoulders and probably a lot of, a lot of answers she could give me for 20 minutes or longer, right? Could have been a yeah. Kevin answer, you know, as my, as my children will call it, the daddy answer, you know, go yeah. on forever. Yeah. She finally looked at me and she said, God's grace. And she just stopped. That was Two. It. Yeah. Yeah. God's grace. Yeah. And I asked her to bless me and she did. And it was great. Mm. And I flew off the, I, my feet didn't leave the ground, didn't touch the ground for quite a while, yeah. but there holy, was this, holy ground, holy ground. And there yeah. was this understanding that I had from that point forward that I didn't have to have a total understanding of where God wanted me to be, what God wanted me to do, or even why I was searching. Like, what was the whole point of wandering at all? Yeah. That's why I love your book so much. What's the whole point of all this? And it's like, well, in the moment, it's Mary, you know, just saying that to me. In the moment, it was all those people. In their moment, it was my family is what makes it okay. In the moment. And this is, and then to me, it's all pointing towards something. Everything is pointing. And so I trust that this conversation today for me, I don't know, it's, it's heading me in a direction I probably wasn't so sure about when I started. And maybe for you, it'll be the same. And maybe for someone listening, it'll be, where am I today? And what is this pointing to me now? I wanted you to read the beginning of what you read because I do really have a strong belief that right now we are suffering with so much grief and mm -hmm. so much death and so much despair and many of us are really struggling with our mental health or you know emotional physical uh, i'm one of them i have rheumatoid arthritis i have as you may know from some of my videos i have some um, mood disorder you know anxiety issues all these different things that just this year has not made it any easier yeah yeah for sure and yet there was this sense that I got that I could be loved on, that I could, could, not am, not will. And today, I'll be honest, I, I want to thank you because I feel like our conversation, I've been, I've been loved on. Oh, good. That's wonderful to hear. Yeah. I hope that you've gathered some of that being loved on yourself in this conversation. Yeah. You you know, I think a lot, a, a lot of the reason why I was nervous and why we can be um, nervous online, it, we never want to appear insensitive. And we don't, sometimes I feel like Christian people, those representing Jesus can try to give easy answers. <laughs> and, and I, I didn't, and I don't in any way want to negate what happened to you all i know is that my faith has taught me whether it's something i'm going through or the things you've gone through i, I could give you we could both list off a ton of people jesus just makes that better um his presence is, is healing and the um remind me again of the adoption interview that you were doing adoptees that, on. yes in that interview a couple of different times you and the lady mentioned that you, you needed to know you wouldn't ever be left that you needed some somebody in your life to tell you they wouldn't leave you and the very first thing that came to my mind because i'm a lifer in church is jesus words i will never leave you or forsake you. Now that doesn't mean that we don't need humans to walk alongside us. Please God give us those, uh, whether we call them family or community, but Jesus will never leave you or forsake you. And as a Christian, the Holy spirit lives inside of me and he goes nowhere. You know, he, he, he stays with me and I, um, for, 
about 12 years now have attended a Reformed church. I couldn't tell you a ton about the Reformed tradition, but I've learned a little. And one of my very favorite things is um, the Heidelberg Catechism. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but the first question is, what's my only comfort in life and in death? And the answer is, I am not my own, but belong body and soul to Jesus Christ, my Lord. And it's a comfort. Uh, you know, com comfort is the right word there. And I think those of us who sit in his presence, who develop that relationship, who through praise God for therapy, right? Who, who can have professionals that clear some of those pathways for us to further connect there. There's real comfort to be found there. There are, there are, um, ways in my, of course, fellowship, the 12 step fellowship mm -hmm. that, um, people speak of higher power and their faith and their travels. And it's a very strong message that the solution is a spiritual one, right? The yeah. solution to these maladies that I've suffered. And that's appealed to me and, and at times has frustrated me greatly. Yeah. And I think that's really keen for me to explain or at least explore just momentarily here is that that comfort that I'm looking for doesn't mean that it's just it, that, that it's that it, there's no discomfort that comes alongside. So it. good. So good. Yes. See, the and tension. For, yes. Yeah, oh, goodness. And, you know, I'm going to use probably words that you're familiar with, and I'll use them for you rather than, you know, uh, you know, you know, being a Christian is hard, <laughs> you know, loving, you know, like that, finding that comfort that you just described, finding that comfort, accepting that to really embody that, that's, that's a burden that many people would want to lay down. That's an awful, real, it's a, that's an awful comfort to have to, you know, to, to have to shoulder. And that is the paradox, I think, of much of the spiritual walk that I've had. And mm -hmm. I know for me, I, I have had different uh, journeys. Uh, the wandering is what I appealed to me in your story and wandering has been, goodness gracious, seemed eternal for me. <laughs> and yet the, the wandering, I think, um, how do I want to put this? It has allowed me to see some of the things in my life that are foundational and that allow me to go to church if I wanted to go to church, allow me to have a job, allow me to be a father, allow me to, you know, all these things are not going to save me, right? I am mm -hmm. saved so I can do these things. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that so, much, so often in my wandering, I use the word saved because that's a good lexicon for us to, to, to use. Uh, I think that um, all these things that I tripped over were many times because I was looking for, you know, my actions, like be a good father, uh, learn the things you said that learn the scripture, you know, be, be this, be that, do these things. And then I'm going to find that comfort. I will find comfort because of those things. And it, it was worse than I could ever imagine. Yeah. That wasn't wandering as much as it was near torturous and <laughs> right. Because, you know, because, uh, you know, it just falls flat. It's not. Well, and it's what society teaches us do, do more. Right. And, and I think part of why we can struggle to experience the comfort and the abundant living that Christ offers is because it's not very fast. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's not sexy all the time. I mean, this is a daily, I love, I like the word discipline. Um, maybe not everyone does because it sounds like yucky exercise, but um, it's, it, it's a daily when you feel like it, when you don't, when you get what I call our aha moments, when you don't, there's a routine that sets in. And I believe that it's really more the Holy Spirit doing the work at that point than you. And again, that is, that is very countercultural. 
the fact that we don't have to work. We don't have to check off a list. We don't have to be the perfect mom or dad before we do it. Um, so yeah, yeah. It, it's kind of learning a new rhythm. My, my, uh, my sponsor and, and, and the 12 steps, Richard, hi, Richard. Uh, mm -hmm. he is often, there's an old saying, but it's always fun for me to bring up. He says, and I say it now, which is, you know, I, I put my Superman cape in the dry cleaner and I lost the ticket. And I'm, I'm, I'm not going to try to be, I'm not going to try the guy, try to be the guy who has all the answers anymore. Yeah. What I like about what you said just a second ago was how, you know, when I get the, it's seemingly the aha moment, I get an answer. I'm like, ah, I got it. Sometimes yeah. that's like grabbing a cloud though. Right. As soon yeah. as I try to grab it, I'm like, well, where the heck did that go? <laughs> I just had it. I just had it. Mm -hmm. And this is the truth for me. This is a big truth for me. It's when I stop trying to grab it mm -hmm. and I sit in humility mm -hmm. and I say, thank you. Thank you for the aha moment. I'm sure I'll forget it and you'll have to remind me again later. Yeah. yeah. And then when I don't get it, when I don't have all the answers, I also want to sit in that humility. And so today, I don't think that you and I just disclosed to the world all the answers. <laughs> we didn't certainly Next disclose time. them. We didn't disclose them to each other. So anyone who's really <laughs> curious, as soon as I stop the recording, Tracy and I are going to really talk to each other about the yeah. all the answers because we yeah. know everything. <laughs> all I really want to say is in true humility, thank you for this time today, Tracy. It was so wonderful to talk to you and so wonderful to have you be a part of my life. Yeah. Well, thank you again as well. I've enjoyed it. Tracy Rhodes is the author of the book, Not mm -hmm. All Who Wander Spiritually Are Lost, a story of church. She is a writer and Bible teacher and blogs regularly at tracesoffaith.com. You can follow her where I found her on Twitter, where she can be found with the username Traces of Faith. I hope that we can absolutely meet again, either on Twitter or in the future. Thank you so much, Tracy. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Take care. Hmm. Did you hear the wind chimes coming? That was beautiful. They I know. I hope, I hope it didn't overwhelm. Do you think? Sometimes, sometimes, um,